Well, uh, during the last year of our Lord's life, on, during His three and a half year ministry on earth, He had an encounter that was pretty unique, pretty interesting. Uh, not unlike, I guess, some of the other encounters He had during His ministry, but this one was uh, unique for a couple of reasons. First of all, it happened the day after His experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember, He went up with Peter, James, and John, and He was glorified, and it was just an incredible moment, one of only two times during Christ's earthly ministry when God spoke directly from heaven to earth. And both times He said the same thing, by the way. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him is what He added in this case. And so coming off of that, they come down the mountain. And, uh, and, and the next day, He's out. He's, he comes upon the crowds. He sees the crowds are interacting with the scribes. And there's kind of a commotion and some discussion uh, taking place, and, and uh, he asks, hey, hey, what's going on? And this man comes up to him. We read about this in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this man comes up to him, and he has a demon-possessed son. And he begins to tell this harrowing story to the Savior about how his son would foam at the mouth, uh, how he would, he would gnash his teeth when the demons would get control of him, uh, how, how he would, they would throw this young boy into fires whenever he would be near a fire, or they would throw him into water when he would be near water. And Jesus is kind of uh, frustrated with, with the crowd and with his disciples as we find out a little bit later on. And he, first of all, he, he asks a couple of questions. Jesus was the master of asking questions. If you asked Jesus a question, you could almost count on he was going to respond with a question. But first, before dealing with this man and his demon-possessed son, Jesus looks at this crowd and the commotion and the disciples that are there, and he says, O oh, faithless generation, how long will I be with you, and how long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Talking about the young boy. So his first question, how long must I be with you? Well, basically he's saying, I've been with you all this time and you still don't trust me. And even after the experience to the disciples that we just had yesterday, you don't trust the power that is, that is in your midst. This should not have been a problem. This should have been an oh, by the way, knowing that I am in your midst. And then his second question showed how he was sort of frustrated by this lack of faith. How long? Shall I put up with you? Reminds me of what we talked about last week when Paul said, When the Lord comes, will he find faith on the earth? So Jesus summons the Father and he says to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And Mark's account in Mark chapter 9 tells us, quote, when the, the, when the man heard this, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. How, how many of us can relate to this man? You know, we believe in God. We believe in Jesus, His Son. We believe in His ability to save us from the penalty of sin. We've placed our faith in, in Jesus as the only hope for eternal life. And hopefully you've done that if you're here this morning. We believe so many important things about God, and yet there are just as many times when our faith wanes. In other words, we believe in general about our Creator God, but when it comes to certain specific moments, sometimes we doubt. Lord, I believe in You, but... Help my unbelief in this situation, this circumstance, this crisis, whatever it may be. We've been there, haven't we? We can, we can all relate to this man. And we can, we, can, we can relate to the emotion that he expressed with the tears. How desperately he wanted his son to be healed. And, and how much he knew that Jesus was the one who could heal him. And how much he believed in him. And yet, it, it, tearfully, he expressed in this moment, his lack of faith. Well, the book of Hebrews has a lot to say about faith. It points us repeatedly to the author and finisher of our faith. We're going through this series entitled Unshakable Faith, Trusting God 
in trying times. And just by way of review, uh, we, we talked about how this was written in roughly 67 to 69 A.D. by an anonymous author, at least anonymous biblically. And he's writing to a group of Jewish Christians. These were devout Jews who had gotten saved as Christianity began to spread. And the church was now some 30 years old at this point. And these were Jews who had become believers in Christ. But as the church grew and spread, uh, the Roman Empire began to get more and more nervous about the way, or Christianity as it by now was being called. And so they were ratcheting up the persecution, particularly in the late 60s A.D. Nero, the Roman emperor, was burning Christians at the stake, gathering up their families, forbidding them from worshiping together. That's why the writer of Hebrews <clears throat> goes on to say, which we will see in chapter 10, uh, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, uh, as some are doing. Because to be associated with the church in that day meant, in many cases, to, be, to suffer persecution. And so the writer writes this, this book of Hebrews, which we have as 13 chapters. Remember, the chapters and verses weren't added to the Bible until 1,500 years after Christ, but it helps us study it better that way. So the 13 chapters of this letter to the Hebrews are all about hanging on to their faith, maintaining a steadfast trust in the Lord, enduring this affliction, this persecution, trusting God in the midst of these difficult times. And in the message that we come to today, or the section that we come to today in chapter 3, we're coming to the second of five warning passages that the writer of Hebrews uh, gives. So within this letter, it's all about the same theme. You know, trust Jesus, stick with Jesus. He's better than Judaism. He's better than the angels. He's, he's the fulfillment of the shadow of Judaism. All these things that we've already talked about. But in the midst of that, he, he gives five warning passages where he sort of really takes on a little bit of a stronger tone. In some cases, very strong. And he, and he issues a warning, a direct warning, about what happens if you abandon the faith and the implications of that in the Christian life when we, when we really doubt uh, the Lord. This is the second one. We've already looked at one back in chapter 2, and we talked about the danger of neglect, why it, it can be pretty risky to neglect the day-to-day -day spiritual matters of the Christian life, studying the Word, praying, and those types of things. But today, we're going to look at the danger of of doubt. And we're going to follow the same outline that we did with the first warning passage, and that is we're going to look at the caution, the concern, the consequence, and then the cure. But what's interesting about this passage is before he gets to the actual warning itself, he gives a bit of a preface in verses 7 uh, through 11. And Hebrews 3, 7 through 11 is actually a direct quote by the author of Psalm 95. 7 through 11. Just coincidentally, the verse numbers are the same. So Psalm 95 is what we call an enthronement psalm. There are, I think, seven of them. Uh, psalms 95 to 99 are enthronement psalms. Psalm 93 is an enthronement psalm. And I think Psalm 47, if I remember right, is an enthronement psalm. What's an enthronement psalm? It's just a psalm that speaks of God's universal reign ultimately being fulfilled in the coming kingdom someday. It's just a reminder that God is in control of everything and that whatever this little minor circumstance that you're having in your little corner of the globe, you need to step back and see the big picture. God reigns and He's going to ultimately reign through His eternal Son, Jesus Christ, when He takes the throne. So it's interesting that in, if you remember what we talked about last week in the first part of chapter 3, the writer makes a comparison between Moses and Jesus and he sort of calls to mind you know, Moses to his readers, a very appropriate thing to do since these were Jews who had become Christians. Moses was a very important person in Judaism. And so that comparison between Christ and Moses uh, led to a natural one between their followers. And so this whole passage in the rest of chapter 3 is sort of, hey, look at what Moses' followers did and let's, let's apply that to your situation in the first century under Roman a persecution. The conduct of the Israelites basically was a challenge to the readers of Hebrews to maintain their faith in God. So we'll just quickly read these first few verses, or what I call the preface. So therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, notice the writer of Hebrews, writing in 67 AD, let's say, refers to an Old Testament passage written a thousand years earlier as divine, being the words of the Holy Spirit. Peter would later tell us that uh, holy men of God wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's just a strong statement about the infallibility of the Bible and that the Old Testament 
is, in fact, God's Word. We know the New Testament is too, but at this time the New Testament was still being written. So he appeals to Psalm 95, this, this enthronement psalm, and he says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness. So the psalmist is referring back in, for the benefit of the Jewish people a thousand years ago to something that from their perspective had happened 400 years earlier during the Exodus uh, wanderings in that 40-year period in the wilderness. The Exodus was 1446 B.C. until 1406 B.C. when Joshua took the second generation across the Jordan into the land of Canaan. So, But here we are in roughly 1000 B.C. and the psalmist is talking about this day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works for 40 years. I mean, think about what went on in the wilderness, how many times God showed himself faithful to that generation. But he says, still quoting here from Psalm 95, Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They've not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. So with that backdrop, which no doubt the readers were very familiar with Psalm 95, and certainly they were very well acquainted with the story of the Israel's exodus and wanderings in the wilderness, with that backdrop he starts with the caution. And the caution is this, do not doubt the Lord. Don't do what they did. Don't do what they did. Now we're going to come back and talk about what it means that they didn't enter their rest, but there was a consequence for their lack of faith. And listen to what he says, Beware, brethren, beware, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. In other words, we've seen this movie, and you're going to forfeit certain blessings if you too d depart from the Lord and, and don't have faith, if you doubt God's ability to see you through this circumstance. And that's what the children of Israel did in the wilderness. They didn't, when it says they didn't enter their rest, it doesn't mean they went to hell. Remember, the entire generation except for Joshua and Caleb died, including Moses. And Moses certainly is not in hell today. The rest was the special blessings and privileges of the land of milk and honey that awaited them. But because of their evil heart of unbelief, they didn't get that reward. So we're talking here about rewards. And just as the children of Israel in their day had certain blessings that would have awaited them if they'd have had a steadfast faith, likewise Christians, both in the first century, the audience to whom the writer of Hebrews is speaking, and us today, 2,000 years later, have certain rewards that await those who steadfastly trust God throughout their lives. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But this word, beware. It's interesting. It's the Greek word blepo. It means to look for or to watch out for. It's used very often in the New Testament. In fact, it's used 135 times in eight of those in Hebrews. It's often translated take heed. Take heed. So, in other words, listen up is what he's basically saying. Listen up, brethren. Don't do what they did. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. So that's what we're supposed to watch out for. Unbelief. Unbelief. Again, if you think back on the Israelites, that was the crux of the problem in their day. It was a lack of faith. Even though God is faithful, He's immutable, He's God, He never changes, and He's always trustworthy, His chesed love or faithfulness is always available to the Jewish people, just as it is to us today, uh, they nevertheless continued to doubt Him in spite of that. Uh, in, in Numbers, uh, we meet, we meet as... Uh, Joshua and Caleb are speaking to the Israelites after spying out the land. Remember that? The spies go out, oh, and they come back, and all of them but Joshua and Caleb are like, oh, well, there's no way. These guys are huge. They're terrible. We'll never defeat them. Forget it. Woe is me. Let's turn back. And here's what Joshua said. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Twice, he says there, do not fear. See, the greatest indicator of a lack of faith is fear, is fear. I mean, did the children of Israel really think that after God rescued them in miraculous fashion from the pharaohs in Egypt, provided for them time and again for 40 years, got them all the way up to the edge of the Jordan, and then He was going to just abandon them and have them fall at the hands of these giants in the land? It was really embarrassing. When you think about it, and yet how many times do we do the same thing, showing this 
unbelief. The greatest indicator of a lack of faith is fear. So you want to evaluate the strength of your own faith. Ask yourself, what are you afraid of? What is it that you fear most? That's where your faith is being tested, right there in that area. Trust God. So what is faith? Well, faith is certainty or assurance. It's the certainty that something is true or the assurance that something is true. The book of Hebrews actually gives us a definition of faith since it's the whole book is about trusting God in trying times. Later on in chapter 11, the verse that we read uh, as our scripture reading today, the writer tells us, what is faith? Well, I'm glad you asked. Faith is what? The substance of things hoped for. What does that word substance mean? Now, this is the New King James. Uh, of course, we know the Bible wasn't written in English. Substance is the word hypostasis, or hypostasis is how we would transliterate it in English. It means your essence, uh, the very essence or substantial nature. It's only used five times, hypostasis, in the entire New Testament. But it's interesting, uh, another one of the times it's used is in Hebrews, and we've already come across it in chapter 1, right out of the chute. When he's talking about Christ and he says, Who Christ being in the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, Hebrews 1.3. Remember that? Christ is of God is the express image of His person. That word person is hypostasis. Basically it's saying that Christ is God. He is the essence of God. He's not just a, a, a representation of God or a separate. He is one with God. Jesus during his earthly ministry, said in John 10, I and my Father are one. Hypostasis. So faith is the confidence in the very nature of what it is we hope for. Now some other English translations, I think, help us understand what this means. For example, the New American Standard says faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Okay? That's why we know that the definition of faith is assurance or certainty. The NIV puts it this way, faith is being sure of what we hope for. We can all relate to that, right? That's what faith is. That's the essence of faith. If you're certain of something, you believe it. If you're unsure, you don't believe it. See, there are really only two options with any proposition. Either you believe it or you don't. If you haven't made up your mind yet or you're still thinking about it or you're unsure, that's by definition is unbelief. So you either believe something or you don't. That man with the demon-possessed son, he believed in God but he wasn't sure about God's ability, Christ's ability in this moment with his son. His faith was wavering. It is a nominological impossibility, a mental impossibility to believe something and not believe it at the same time, the same object. You can believe one thing and not believe another, but you can't say, I believe this, but I don't believe it at the same time because belief, by definition, is the absence of doubt. But he goes on to define it not only as being sure of what we hope for, but back to the New King James, it's the evidence of what we can't see. That's faith. And uh, later in chapter 11, the writer points in Hebrews to the champions of the faith in Israel who kept on believing God's promises of a perfect earthly kingdom even though they didn't experience those promises in their own lifetimes. But they were all promised this coming kingdom where Christ would reign. David was promised that Abraham before him was promised that he would have land and seed and blessing. And, and there was this kingdom that is, as the New Old Testament goes on and time goes on, takes on more clarity and definition. And yet many of the prophets and kings, all of them in fact, never got to experience that kingdom. And yet they still had faith. And, and the writer reminds us that such faith will be richly rewarded when the kingdom comes someday. Listen to this verse from chapter 11 talking about these champions of the faith. These all died, how did they die? In the faith. They held on to their faith till the end. But they didn't receive the promises. Again, there's the, don't confuse this with he heaven or hell. We tend to oversimplify everything down to heaven or hell. But there's a lot more to the afterlife than just heaven or hell. Your home in heaven is secure. The moment you trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation, the moment faith meets the gospel, you are born again in that punctiliar moment in time, and 33 things happen instantaneously according to Scripture. 
Uh, things like you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise instantly. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You're born again, regenerated. You're reconciled to a holy God. You're, uh, you know, no longer under the wrath of God. Uh, you, you are uh, adopted into the family of God and so on and so forth. So that's a settled issue. Your position in Christ can never change once you've received the free gift of eternal life by faith alone in Christ alone. But in the earthly kingdom to come, we're all going to be a part of that. And we're going to have different blessings and rewards and things. The Bible has a lot to say about rewards. Every New Testament writer talks about rewards. In my book, What Lies Ahead, I have a whole chapter on the doctrine of eternal rewards. So he's talking about how these champions of the faith held on to the faith. They steadfastly never wavered. And yet, they didn't get to receive the promises, but they still embraced these promises. And that's the example that he wants to set forth. Not the one of the wilderness generation that grumbled and complained and doubted God constantly but these other heroes of the faith. So if faith is the certainty or assurance that something is true, what is unbelief? What is a lack of faith? Well, it's the opposite, doubt, right? Not assurance, but doubt. Unbelief, by definition, is the opposite of belief. It's to doubt or be uncertain about something. And maturity in the Christian life is measured by the strength of your faith, not by the quality of your behavior. So there are a lot of morally good people who've never trusted in Christ. In your flesh, you can muster up the strength legalistically to keep a list of do's and don'ts. That has nothing to do with how mature spiritually you are. Faith is the greatest indicator of spiritual maturity. In that same chapter, chapter 11, he reminds us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. You want to please God? You've got to have faith. Live the life of faith. Uh, he who comes to God must believe that He is and that what? He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Rewards. That's what this is about. This isn't about heaven or hell. That's, been, that's a long settled issue for these original audience and for those of you that know the Lord today. But there is a great value in living by faith even under hard times. And there's also a great consequence if you don't. And that's what he's talking about. And so the concern, you know, the caution is don't doubt the Lord. Why not? Well, because if you continue to doubt, your heart may become hard. Your heart may become hard. It doesn't take long to form bad habits. The more you doubt, the easier it is to doubt the next time. The more you trust, the more likely you are to exercise faith the next time. And so he says in verse 13 of our text, Exhort one another daily while it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened. Lest any of you be hardened. Remember, he quoted in Psalm, from Psalm 95 in the preface, verse 8, Do not harden your hearts like they did in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. So he's saying if you doubt the Lord, the danger here is your heart may become hard. Well, what's a hard heart? A hard heart is, is referring to spiritual atrophy. Atrophy, degeneration, decline, a decrease from disuse, right? See, due to a repeated failure on the part of the Christian to trust God, we can develop spiritual atrophy. And that results in a pattern of self-absorption, earthly mindedness, fleshly behavior, and guess what? Fear. And so every now and then the Lord brings across our paths these little trials, these Opportunities to exercise faith so that if something big happens in this fallen world where Satan is the prince, we will already be in the habit of exercising faith. And so some of the most beautiful Christians, and you've seen them, I have, are those who you think to yourself, if I was in their shoes, if I was going through what they're going through, there's no way I could handle it. And yet they are like a rock. The whole world could be falling apart around them, and yet they're trusting God. Like Job said, yet though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, right? That kind of faith. But conversely, if every time something happens, you're, woe is me, why me, I don't understand, well, how am I going to get out of this, what's going to happen, and fear takes over, then that's going to be your knee-jerk reaction every time something uh, comes up. So, you know, we see this repeatedly in the children of Israel in the wilderness. Their habit was to doubt. Remember Numbers 14. Uh, how long will these people reject me? How long will they not believe me? You realize re failing to trust God is rejecting Him, basically. Uh, 
It's basically shaking your fist heavenward and saying, God, I know you said X, Y, and Z, but I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it. Deuteronomy 9, likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you. What did you do? You replied against the commandment of the Lord your God, and you did not believe Him. You didn't believe Him. So the, the concern is your heart might become hard. Notice in this verse, in verse 13, uh, lest there be any of you a hardened, uh, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, unbelief is sin. In fact, the simplest definition of sin is any time you don't trust God. All sin can boil down can be boiled down to a lack of faith. That's why Paul said in Romans fourteen, uh, "Whatever is not from faith is sin." See, whatever you do in the context there is talking about eating meat sacrificed to idols and different what is lawful but not beneficial and so forth. But whatever is done without the conviction that God has approved it, by definition, that's sin. Either God's in it and we're called to a life of faith and we're going to do what God says or we're not going to trust Him. Whatever is not from faith is sin. So if you think about every sin, every, you know, even the little sins, right, whatever it might be, in, in every instance, you as a believer, if you know the Lord Jesus, have this option of how you're going to respond. On the one hand, you've got, say, the proverbial angel on the, on, we'll say the left shoulder, this makes me feel better identifying Satan with the left. But anyway, uh, on the left shoulder, right, uh, and, and, and he's saying, you should do this. Isn't that apple really shiny? Won't you love it? It's great. But then over here, you've got the Word of God through the Spirit of God within you saying, no, no, no. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's not good. It's not going to end well. This is dangerous. So you've got two options. The issue is, who are you going to believe and in essence, every time we choose to go the way of the flesh, we're in essence saying, I don't believe God, I believe me more than God. <laughs> I believe the flesh more than God. So it really does all come down to faith. And the concern is, if you continue to doubt God, it'll be easier to doubt God the next time, and you'll become hardened. So I want to take a moment to, to, to talk about this notion of the relationship between faith and obedience. And this is a, a really an important paradigm in my ministry and my theology that you'll see me come back to again and again. And some of you, if you followed my teaching, may have seen me walk through this. But I call it the no trust obey chart, right? No trust obey. So we start out over here in the right. And the, the fact of the matter is, and we all understand this, that you don't generally obey what you don't trust. You don't, do you? I mean, if some stranger walked in the back of the room and, first of all, was able to get past Gary, let's just assume that for the sake of this illustration, and he, and he announced to everyone, hey, let me have everyone's attention. Uh, John Wigglemeyer would like everyone to stand up, spin around, and then sit back down. Go. What's the first thing that you would say? First of all, who are you? And second of all, who's John Wigglemeyer? And why in the world should I do what he has to say? Well, we're not going to just blindly obey something we don't trust, right? But we don't trust what we don't know. And we don't know what we don't study. So what most people do when it comes to living the Christian life is they start over there, out, over there on the right. It's all about obedience. I've just got to muster up the willpower to stop doing this or start doing this or do this more or do this less. But the biblical model is no. Obedience isn't the problem. Faith is the problem. The more you trust God, the more obedience will just naturally flow, right? Well, why don't we trust God? You know why we don't trust God? We don't know Him. We don't know Him. People aren't in the Word. They're not in a Bible-believing church. They're not studying the Word on their own. They're not feeding their Christian lives with the Word of God. And then something comes up, and they wonder why it's hard for them to respond appropriately because the, the, the ammunition's not there. You don't obey what you don't trust. You don't trust what you don't know, and you don't know what you don't study. So the Bible tells us that all Scripture is profitable for us. And how is it profitable? For doctrine, reproof, correction, righteousness. It goes on to say so that we may be thoroughly equipped for what? Every good work. So it starts with the Bible. The Bible isn't the end-all, be-all, right? You know, I know there are a lot of biblically brilliant, morally bankrupt people. You can intellectually study this and name all the tribes of Israel and the judges and the years that they served and every king and the 12 disciples and all the ologies and isms of the, of, of the scriptures. But unless you really trust it, 
and put it into practice, you're just you know, biblically brilliant, morally bankrupt. So it starts with knowledge, but what's the purpose of knowledge? Timothy tells us that we will live out a righteous life. So after you study, then notice again what we read in Hebrews 11, without faith it's impossible to please Him. We've got to believe God's Word. And then once we believe it, we gird up the loins of our mind, Peter tells us, and rest our hope fully on the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming ourselves to our former lusts and our ignorance. Now that we know who God is, it's more natural to trust in Him. Why would I want to trust myself when I've got the opportunity to trust God? So the idea here is the more you study the Bible, the better you get to know God. The better you know God, guess what? The more you're going to trust Him. And the more you trust Him, the more you'll obey Him. So we need to study the Word and rightly divide the Word. Really, the Christian life all comes down to that great old hymn, Trust and Obey. You know that old hymn? We should sing that sometime. I just, as I was thinking about this message, that, I've been, that tune has been uh, playing in my mind. You remember, when we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I love the second verse. Notice, not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but His smile quickly draws. Not a doubt or a fear. That's what we're talking about. See, the Christian life, you don't have to fear or doubt when you trust and obey. That's the reason that Paul, so many times in his writings, challenges believers. It's one of the many reasons that I suspect that Paul wrote Hebrews, but I can't prove it necessarily. But I, I'm pretty sure when we all get to heaven, there's going to be this glass-enclosed case with a copy of the original autograph of Hebrews, and it's going to say, Signed, Paul the Apostle. And then I'll tell everybody, See, I told you so. But until that moment, I have to have at least a, a modicum that I might be wrong. I mean, it's bound to happen eventually, right? Um, so 1 Corinthians 16, Paul says, stand fast in the faith. The writer of Hebrews is talking about dying in the faith and living out the faith and making sure that like, the, like these heroes of the faith, that you stand fast in the faith. In 2 Corinthians, and by the way, it's no accident that he so frequently talks about this in Corinthians. The Corinthians had all sorts of behavioral problems, didn't they? And, and so what's his solution? Trust God. If you trust God, you won't have all these behavioral problems. And so he says in his second letter to them, walk by faith, not by sight. Later on in that same, in that same letter, he says, examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. That is not an uh, admonition to see if you're going to heaven. Because Paul, in that same verse, goes on to say, lest we be disqualified. Otherwise, he'd be doubting his own salvation, which you know is unbiblical. Not only that, but Paul, if anyone had confidence, it was Paul who said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. So this is not a verse that says, check out your life to see if you're really a Christian, the way most commentators suggest. It's saying, check out your life to see if you're in the faith. Right now, in this moment, are you doing what I said a couple chapters ago, walking by faith, not by sight? So the, 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 the caution is don't doubt the Lord. Why? Because you might... Your heart might become hard. What's the consequence if your heart becomes hard? Well, you won't experience the fullness of God's rest. The Israelites missed the promised land, not heaven, but the promised land, because they doubted the Lord. Now, some of that generation that died, they are in hell. It all depends on whether they individually believe in the Lord Jesus. Everyone has to be saved the same way, by faith alone and Christ alone, right? Some of them got saved, some of them didn't. In that day, it was a looking to Yahweh as the provider of the Lamb, just like He did with Abraham and Isaac. Today, it's actually believing in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died and rose again, because we have the full story. But either way, it was by faith. Abraham believed God and was declared righteous. So some in the wilderness generation undoubtedly believed God and was saved. Some wasn't. But what he's talking about here is the fact that they didn't maintain their faith, and therefore they didn't get to experience the land of milk and honey. What did he say? Whom did he swear that they would not enter their rest? But those who didn't obey, they couldn't enter in. Why? Because of unbelief. Now we're going to talk about rest in the next sermon in this series. Um, and it's a fascinating word. It's used nine times in the New Testament. And eight of them are right here in chapters 3 and 4 of Hebrews. So it's a really interesting word. 
Uh, and by the way, the only other time it's used in the Bible is in Acts 7 in Stephen's famous speech, the longest sermon in the book of Acts, right before he's stoned to death, when he quotes Isaiah 66.1 and speaks of the rest as being God's universal reign in the kingdom someday. So it, we'll, we'll come back to that. But his, his point is, they didn't experience the fullness of God's rest, and neither will you. Uh, they certainly not, shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers. Numbers 14 says, even Jude, the writer of, uh, of the New Testament book of Jude, the Lord's brother, I want to remind you, though, once you knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, destroyed those who did not believe. The word destroyed there is apolumia. It doesn't mean sent to hell. It just means they, they died. <laughs> they, they died. They didn't get to enter his rest. And that's what he's saying to you. You're not going to enter your rest either. You're not going to have the rewards and blessings that come in the kingdom someday if you don't trust and obey God throughout your Christian life. Uh, on the banks of the Jordan, Joshua gave this charge to the people before that generation did get to go in the land. He said, listen, the Lord God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. So what does he say in Joshua chapter 1? Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee wherever thou goest. Again, the biggest indicator of a lack of faith is fear. Fear and doubt are twins. Uh, in verse 14, this rest for Christians means being a partaker of Christ. Now this word partaker is, a, is the word metakoi. It means partner with Christ, special intimacy, special roles to play. Uh, here's an example where a couple of English, modern English translations are very bad on this. The, the NIV and the NIV talk about we, have, we will share in Christ. No, no, in Christ is a specific positional term in Scripture, Pauline in particular, that means we are positionally with Christ once and for all. That's not contingent upon us holding on to our confidence, right? In fact, Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, even if we are faithless, apistos, no faith, like atheist means no God. No, even if you have no faith, God is faithful because He can't deny Himself. We're a child of God. Nothing can change that. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that when Jesus rebuked that crowd that day and said, Oh, faithless generation, He wasn't consigning them all to hell? He's just saying, You're not trusting me in this moment. And, and, and if we do hold fast our confidence to steadfast to the end, then we get to be partakers with Christ in the kingdom. Remember He told the disciples they would reign on 12 thrones with Him in the kingdom? We too have certain rewards and blessings that await us uh, in the kingdom. You know, we talked last week about the parable of the minas. Remember, the one who didn't do anything with that mina while the king was away preparing the kingdom, then he comes back to offer the kingdom. He asks his servants to come to him and, and give an account of what they did. The one that we looked last week at, the one who turned the one mina into ten, and he says, wow, good for you. You've been faithful. little, be in charge of ten cities in the kingdom. But what about the one who did nothing? Jesus says, well, you still get into the kingdom, but let me have that mina. You've proven yourself unworthy in, in, your, in your test time in the church age to really be responsible for much in the kingdom. So it's still a blissful, glorious, utopian time, but for some it will be even more of a blessing and rejoicing than others. There will be no sorrow or sin or anything like that, but clearly there are levels of reward in the kingdom. And the illustration I like to use is a football analogy. If you're you know, if you're on the goal line with two seconds to go in the game, down by five points, let's say, you don't even need the extra point, you're just down by five, all you need to do is push that ball across the goal line, touchdown, last play of the game, you win the game. And let's even up the odds. Let's say it's the Super Bowl, right? And uh, so here it is. What, and, and the coach calls timeout. He's got one play, one chance, and his two options are he's got two running backs on the roster. One of them uh, set the NFL record that year in rushing with 3,000 yards. He carried the ball an average of 40 times a game, only fumbled once but recovered his own fumble, and scored three touchdowns a game. The other running back is a second stringer who's only been in the game twice the entire season. Both times he fumbled it and both times he lost the ball. Who are you going to give the ball to? In the kingdom, those who have proven themselves faithful are going to be given a better stewardship in the kingdom if you've been faithful in earth. It would be partakers with Christ. So, the cure is simply remember and believe the promises of God. Uh, notice what he says in verse 14. We'll skip back a, a verse to verse 14, which we skipped over. Uh, if if you, you're partakers of Christ, but there's a contingency here. It's contingent upon holding fast the beginning 
of our confidence steadfast to the end. So you've got to be confident. You've got to remember and believe the promises of God. He says this again and again throughout Hebrews. Show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Don't become sluggish, he says in chapter 6. And if you do, you'll inherit the promises. In chapter 10, he says, Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Later on in chapter 10, he says, Don't cast away your confidence so easily. One time I was mowing the lawn, and uh, we lived in Illinois at the time, and out on, in, the, in the woods in a little area, and there was a big ravine behind my house. And I was mowing the lawn, and all of a sudden I looked down in front of me, and I, the sun caught something shiny, and I, I bent down, and it was this big uh, nut, that, like you would screw on the end of a big bolt, right? Well, I didn't want to roll over it and have it fly out and hit a window or something, so I just picked it up and just carelessly cast it down the ravine. Well, about five minutes later, I'm continuing to mow, and my front wheel of the lawnmower falls off. <laughs> Well, you can bet I was regretting my decision to cash that nut over the side of the ravine. But if we think about it and maintain our confidence, it has great reward. So don't doubt the Lord. Why? Because over time, you'll heart, your heart might become hard, and then you won't experience the fullness of God's rest and all the rewards that He has for you in the kingdom. Instead, keep on remembering and believing the promises of God. Most of the Psalms that we read about, that we read about in Scripture, are them reciting what God has done for them. <laughs> so they will remember and be faithful. So what's the takeaway? Well, stop doubting because God can be trusted. That's what I want you to remember this week. And whatever may come, stop doubting. God can be trusted. How many of God's promises can you recite? When's the last time you encouraged another believer to keep trusting God? Are there any deep-seated fears that you need to let go of and, and trust God? Stop doubting. God can be trusted. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this uh, passage today in Hebrews 3. And Lord, we know it's convicting to all of us. And we confess the weakness of our faith. But Lord, we serve a, a powerful, mighty God. And Lord, we thank you that we have no reason to doubt and Lord, we pray that you would embolden us, strengthen our faith, help us to get to know you better and to trust you more and to obey you more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.